On this episode of Real Truth, we consider what to do when we face persecution or opposition from our employer. How can we handle this? Also, as inflation continues to rise, there is a temptation to give less to the church and the needy. How should we use our money in a bad economy? Let's consider the truth about all of that up next. We are going to start this episode with a Bible truth. There are many ways that we can face persecution as Christians. And it is important for us to know how to handle it. Today, I want us to study 1 Peter 2 verses 18-25 to see how we should react to a difficult or oppressive job as Christians. It is certainly possible to endure persecution in the workplace. And this passage speaks directly on this subject. Let's start with verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, before we proceed, let me say a few things about slavery. God's word never advocates for slavery, but it does address slavery since it was such a large part of ancient society. Slavery was accepted in ancient times and was an important part of their culture. Over 50% of Roman population were slaves, including many professionals like teachers or doctors. Many people even sold themselves into slavery for a time because it could be advantageous. It could still be difficult if they had an unkind master, since they still only existed to benefit their owners. This does not mean that slavery was always a means to take advantage of others. Some masters treated their slaves very well, almost like members of the family. Unfortunately, this was not always the case, such as slavery in America. Slavery is always evil and sinful when used to degrade a group of people based on things such as skin color, social status, heritage, ethnicity, profession, etc. It is also evil when slaves are treated harshly and sinned against by their masters. If slaves and masters treated each other as the Bible commanded, Savory would be less of an evil, and could even be neutral. For many in the ancient world, it was how people made a living, and provided for their families. So it is not much different than the modern workplace. Whether or not they were treated justly, slaves were commanded to submit to and respect their masters as we saw in verse 18. This would certainly be difficult in a bad situation, but this is their duty as Christians. Our parallel for life today is the employee in the workplace. Christian employees should submit and remain loyal to their bosses, whether or not they are Christians, and even when it is unfair and harsh. Just because we are Christians does not give us the right to rebel or underperform in the workplace. God encourages us to work hard to make a living, even when it is difficult or if our authority does not know Christ. Now let's continue in verse 19. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. This teaches that it is considered gracious or commendable to endure, even when you are treated unjustly. God wants us to endure that difficulty, and He will help us trust Him during that time. This doesn't mean the actions of the oppressor are commendable, however. It can be difficult to endure unjust suffering, but God can give us the ability to respect our oppressors 
and respond in a godly way. The MacArthur Bible Commentary shares this on the subject. Favor with God is found when an employee treated unjustly accepts his poor treatment with faith in God's sovereign care rather than responding in anger, hostility, discontent, pride, or rebellion. You see, it is always wrong to react to our suffering with sin, even if that suffering is caused by the actions of others. Continuing in verse 20, the Bible says, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. If you sin and are punished for it, that punishment is well deserved. You gain no credit for enduring suffering that you brought on yourself by your own sinful actions. However, sometimes your master, your boss, your parents, or whoever make you suffer for doing good. In this situation, it is commendable to do good and endure that suffering. Our commitment should not be to our comfort, but instead to the will of God and the good works that he requires from us. This is difficult because it goes against our nature. Our nature is to seek revenge and do what brings us pleasure and comfort. We don't want to endure suffering. We want to flee from it. We want to hurt those who hurt us or withhold our full effort all because of our suffering. The Bible continues in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Even though it is difficult to endure suffering, you have been saved by God's grace. Sometimes Christians will have to face suffering unfairly at the hands of others. When we react to our suffering in a way that is godly, it glorifies God and helps us grow in our faith. Christ himself suffered for our sakes. He not only endured suffering to save us, but also to leave us with an example to follow. When Christ endured suffering, he still did the will of his Father. In the same way, we should follow the will of God whenever we suffer. We must follow the steps of Jesus and endure our suffering like he did. Just look at how we are told Jesus responded. Verse 22 says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Peter quotes Isaiah 53 verse 9 here, to demonstrate that Jesus is the perfect example to follow when we respond to suffering. Jesus did not sin when he was oppressed by others. Instead, he patiently endured his unjust suffering and remained silent. He did not lie or try to deceive others just to get out of a bad situation. Of course, Jesus was perfect and he could not have sinned, but the fact that he did not sin and that he lives in us gives us the ability to avoid sin when we suffer. Suffering should not give us an excuse to sin against God. We should continue to follow the example of Jesus and commit no sin when we endure suffering at the hands of others. There is no reason for us to lie or be deceitful because God gives us the strength to persevere when we are treated unjustly. The example from Jesus continues in verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus was reviled. This means that people spoke to him with abusive and evil words. Even though he was reviled, 
he never retaliated with verbal abuse of his own. When he suffered, he never threatened them or even tried to argue. He remained silent and never sought revenge, even though they treated him so poorly. Instead, he handed himself over to God, who would justly judge his accusers. It was not his job to judge them. That's not why he came. It was his job to endure suffering and leave the rest up to God. His mission was to die for sinners out of love for them. In the same way, whenever we are reviled and face suffering, we should not retaliate either. We should trust God in the situation and know that he will ultimately give a just judgment. Revenge is not our job. We are called to respect and love others and to spread the good news of the gospel, even when we are treated poorly. Now in verse 24, the Bible says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus is not just our example because he also took our place when he suffered. Even though he did not sin, he took our sins upon himself when he died on the cross. He took the punishment that we rightly deserve and paid the penalty for our sins. He took the full weight of God's wrath to satisfy a holy God. The purpose of this is that when someone believes in Christ, they died to sin because he paid the penalty of death for us. Sin no longer has power over us because we have been made new by Christ. Now we can live for righteousness. We are now able to live a new life that pleases God because his suffering brings our healing. Now let's look at verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Previously, we were going our own way like sheep, but now we have returned to the fold of God. We have turned toward God in repentance and faith. Jesus is now our shepherd and overseer. This means that he protects us and watches over us. He is now our leader. This is a comforting description for any Christian who is being persecuted for their faith or who is enduring any form of suffering. In our modern culture, you certainly have the option to find a different job. But perhaps your endurance of a difficult boss is a more powerful witness than you realize. It can sometimes be the right thing to change jobs, but don't be hasty to change jobs just because it is difficult. Now let's move on to a new segment, Life Meets Truth. In this segment, I will take a common situation from life and consider how we should respond when met with the truth of Scripture. Something that is common in many of our lives right now is the fact that inflation is at a 40-year high at just under 10%. With the high cost of fuel, food, and other goods, this is straining many lower and middle-class families. This is a difficult situation to face, and it often gives people the impulse to become stingy, stash things away, or even hoard certain items. There can even be a temptation to give less or even completely stop giving to others and to the church. As Christians, we are still commanded to handle our money in a certain way. God wants us to be good stewards with our money, but that is not always easy in a difficult situation. There are some who might not be able to do much more than purchase their essential items. If you are in such a situation, make sure 
that all of your essentials are actually essential. If you consider something like a Netflix subscription as essential, but you pay for it over giving to the Lord, is it really essential? Just make sure you give things the right priority and be careful not to say that something you can live without is truly essential. If you are struggling financially, you can trust that God will provide. But even in that situation, you should still give to the church. The Bible tells us that we should be ready to give according to what we have. In 2 Corinthians 8.12 we are told, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Even when it is extremely difficult, we are taught that if we seek the kingdom of God and chase after his righteousness, that God will provide for us. Luke 12, 24 tells us, Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? In this verse, God shows us that he cares for us. If he cares for the birds, of course he cares for you. Now, if you're struggling financially, I talk about this a little bit more way back in episode 11. If you're in that situation, I encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. However, if you are better off, that doesn't mean that gives you the right to keep all of your money and barely give to the church and others. Besides, your treasure is not found in the things of this world. We are reminded of this in Matthew 6 verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Our treasure is found in heaven. So that is where our focus should be. Not on earthly treasures and possessions. It is certainly nice to have the things of this world, and if you have them, they are a gift from God. But that doesn't mean that that is what we should be living for. What you have is not your own. And God expects you to use what you have been given for the kingdom and glory of God and to help others. Look now at Proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Look also at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Each one must give as he is decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. These verses show us that we should give willingly and cheerfully to honor the Lord. God promises to bless those who do so, even though that might not necessarily amount to material possessions or wealth. God wants all believers to give to those in need. Just look at Proverbs 19:17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. We also taught this in Hebrews 13:16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You see, it is pleasing to God when you help others with what you have been given. Acts 20 verse 35 says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Now he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. God wants us to work hard, earn a living, and give to others. As a result, you will discover the joy of giving. It really is a blessing to give to others when you see how God can use it. Luke 6 verse 35 says, 
but love your enemies and do good and live expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. This shows us that we should do good and even help our enemies with our money. God helps those who are even evil in some ways. He shows common grace toward them and they receive things such as the rain that we that they don't deserve. We should follow that example and give to others. We should not expect anything in return when we give. And God ultimately promises his reward to those who help others. That doesn't mean that we give for the reward. That would be selfish. Look at what the rich are commanded to do in 1 Timothy 6 verses 18 and 19. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. The storing of treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The practice of inflation might not be fair as God would desire. Deuteronomy 25.15 says, A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land, and that the Lord your God is giving you. Even though it is not fair, that does not give us an excuse to stop being good stewards with what we have been given. The Bible even teaches us that it is wise to invest our money in the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25, verses 14-30. To summarize, a man goes on a trip and gives his workers a few different amounts of money. To one of them he gives ten talents, to another one five talents, and the last one only receives one talent. The first two workers invest their money and are praised when the man returns. As a result, they are given more responsibilities. However, the one who received one talent buried it in a field and wasted his opportunity. This made the man unhappy when he returned, and led him to call him a wicked and slothful servant. He takes the single talent away from this man, and gives it to the one who invested his ten talents. A recent article in the Christian Post gives us a good summary of the lesson to be learned from this parable. The lesson is not just about money, but about how faithful we are to use what God gives us to his glory and to ours and others' benefit. In Jesus' time, inflation probably was not anywhere near what it is now. But the lazy servant still cost his master by doing nothing. If this incident occurred today, it would be like giving away a tenth of the value and giving nothing in return. Even in times of high inflation, we should use our money wisely and even invest it. We should not be like the slothful servant and do nothing just because the economy is in bad shape. Be encouraged to trust the Lord for the things that you need and to give back to Him by giving to the church and those in need. But it's helped you cope with the difficult employer. How has this encouraged you to give despite a poor economy? Let me know down in the comments. Please remember to like this video, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Also, follow us on social media and share this video. If you want to support this ministry, please consider donating. As always, thanks for watching. And until next time, walk in the truth.